Hi everyone, welcome back to another lesson. We're talking about a gastrointestinal infection caused by Campylobacter species, and that infection is known as Campylobacteriosis. So Campylobacteriosis is going to be, again, a bacterial infection of the gastrointestinal system by Campylobacter species. Now Campylobacter is a particular bacterium. It's gram-negative, meaning that it stains pink when we do a gram stain on it. It is comma or spiral-shaped or corkscrew shaped. It is flagellated, so it's got a tail, so it can move around. It's motile. It is oxidase positive, and it grows at 42 degrees Celsius. This is going to be important when we talk about how cultures are done on this particular bacteria. And a way to remember this is that Campylobacter likes a hot campfire, 42 degrees Celsius. Now, there are dozens of Campylobacter species. These include Campylobacter jejuni. This is the most common and the most commonly implicated in infections. There's also Campylobacter fetus, Campylobacter coli, and Campylobacter lari. And some other important points to make note of here is that Campylobacter lari can be found in seagulls, and this can be an important cause of Campylobacter infections in children, especially in children who are exposed to seagulls and seagull droppings. Now, Campylobacter infections are a very common cause of diarrheal illness globally, and especially bloody diarrhea. We'll discuss this when we discuss the signs and symptoms later. And in fact, Campylobacter infections are the most common cause of food poisoning in the United States, anywhere from 1.3 to 1.5 million cases per year, and that's in comparison to Seminella infections, which are roughly 1 million per year. And we're going to see that a lot of cases can occur in children. So the peak incidence of Campylobacter infections is going to be in those less than five years of age. So in children, this is going to be related to exposure to animals. We mentioned seagulls, but also poor hygiene. That can also be important. We'll discuss that later. But we can also see high incidences of Campylobacter infections in individuals aged 15 to 29 as well. And what has been noted is that Campylobacter infections have been increasing globally. So the prevalence has been increasing. We do see some changes in infection rates during certain times of the year. For instance, in some developed countries, especially during summer months, we can see about 90% of cases being in summer months. And this is likely due to poor food preparation. So we'll discuss some of the foods that can cause Campylobacter infections in the next slide. So what are some of the ways that individuals can get infected with Campylobacter bacteria? So we can get it from raw or undercooked chicken. Raw or undercooked chicken actually account for about 50 to 70% of cases of Campylobacter infection. We can also get it from unpasteurized milk consumption and exposure to infected animals. Some important infected animals that can harbor this particular bacteria include dogs, cats, and pigs. They may have consumed Campylobacter in some source, and then they have it residing in their gastrointestinal system, and via their feces, we can get contaminated or exposed to those bacteria in that way. So those are some ways that we can get exposed to it that are non-human related, but there are human related issues as well. When an individual does get infected with Campylobacter, they can themselves pass it through their gastrointestinal system into the feces and into the surrounding environment. There can be contamination of water sources, and then if individuals consume water that is contaminated with Campylobacter, then they can get infected that way. And we can also get some infections from person to person. So this can either be due to the fact that one person's infected, they are not washing their hands after using the washroom, and then they start to perhaps touch or expose someone else, or can occur as a sexually transmitted infection in MSM or men who have sex with men. So that's another route of infection whereby Campylobacter can infect patients. Now, when patients are exposed to this particular bacteria, we don't need a whole lot to cause infection. So there's a very low inoculum required for infection. So an, an inoculum is simply how much bacteria is exposed to the patient. So anything from as low as 500 organisms can result in infection. Oftentimes, though, it's going to be more than that. It'll be anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 bacteria that are required for infection. They are somewhat sensitive to stomach acids. They're not as sensitive as say Seminella, but they can be reduced by stomach acid. So what we can see is that individuals who are on antacids or who have low stomach acidity as in patients who are elderly or patients who are taking proton pump inhibitors like pantoprazole can have lower gastric acidity. They can be more likely to get infected or have worse infections. So we can see that with increased inoculums or decreased gastric acidity, which would lead to more bacteria surviving will lead to a shorter incubation period and more severe illness. Incubation period is 
how long it takes for when you get exposed to the bacteria and then when you have symptoms. So there's a delay when you get exposed to when you start having symptoms. That's the incubation period. With more bacteria you are ingesting, you'll have a shorter incubation period and a more severe illness. So what will happen again is that the bacteria can enter into the gastrointestinal system, go through the esophagus, survive the stomach acid. Again, it is somewhat affected by stomach acid. So some of it will be reduced by stomach acid. So again, having higher stomach acid can help prevent more severe infections. It will survive the stomach and enter into the small intestine. The first part of the small intestine is known as the duodenum. And the second part of the small intestine is known as the jejunum. And the third part of the small intestine is known as the ileum. So what will happen is Campylobacter bacteria will infect the jejunum in ileum. This is where we get the name Campylobacter jejuni. This comes from the fact that it often will harbor in and infect the jejunum of the small intestine, but we can also see it spreading and extending throughout the colon as well. So it can go through the large intestine. Now, how does it cause infection? So what will happen is in the small intestine, again, in the second and third part of the small intestine, the jejunum in the ileum, the bacteria becomes attracted to mucus and certain components of bile. So there's something called fucose in bile that the bacteria is also attracted to. So it's attracted to mucus in the small intestine and also bile. And via chemotaxis will use its flagella, that tail-like structure it has, to move toward the intestinal epithelium. So the intestinal epithelium is the inside layer of the intestine. It also has certain structures on its membrane called adhesins, which allow it to adhere to the small intestinal epithelium. And then it will invade the intestinal epithelium. So it essentially just burrows in to the inner layer of the intestines. So it gets inside the intestines, and in doing that, it actually can destroy intestinal epithelial cells, so it damages and destroys cells. This can lead to bleeding, which is going to be important when we talk about the sign of symptoms. The bacteria can also release certain enterotoxins. Some strains can release heat labile cholera-like enterotoxins that cause water diarrhea. Some enterotoxins that some strains release can include cytolethal distending toxin. This actually will prevent immune response, and that can lead to a worsening severity. There can also then become what we call crypt abscesses. So there can be these pockets of abscess that can occur due to the bacterial infection, and then ulcerations. So all of these can lead to immune response. We get neutrophils and eosinophils coming into the area. So you get all this inflammation, ulcerations, abscesses, and immune cells, and damage to the intestinal epithelial cells. All of this is going to lead to signs and symptoms we're going to discuss in the next slide. The average incubation period, again, we mentioned incubation period, is the time from which you get exposed to bacteria to when you start to exhibit symptoms. The average incubation period is anywhere from one to five days on average, up to seven days. So generally, we may see signs and symptoms occurring within one to two days of exposure, but it could be up to seven days in some cases. And all that pathophysiological damage in the intestines leads to what we call Campylobacter enterocolitis. Itis refers to inflammation. Entero refers to intestines. And col or coli refers to the colon or the large intestine. So we get inflammation of the intestines and the colon. Again, most of the time it's going to be the jejunum and ileum of the small intestines. Some cases we can have what we call a prodromal phase. So this can occur within the first one to three days if patients do have him. This can include high fever, so 40 degrees Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit, body aches and pains, dizziness in some cases. And if it's present, if we get this prodromal phase, this these symptoms that occur before the gastrointestinal symptoms that occur, if it's present, it indicates that the patient's going to have a more severe illness. So some patients may have the prodromal phase, and then once that concludes, then they can start to have gastrointestinal symptoms. And in some cases, patients simply start with gastrointestinal symptoms, and these include acute diarrhea. This is going to be bloody diarrhea in about 50% of cases. So it's going to be a very important cause of bloody diarrhea. So very important. Campylobacter infections, especially Campylobacter jejuni, is going to be an important cause of acute bloody diarrhea. Acute meaning that it is a diarrhea that is going to last less than two weeks. It can be watery in some cases, or it could start out watery and become bloody, or it can alternate between watery and bloody. We can also see it being mucoid as well. There can be mucus within the stool. This can also occur. And in some cases, the diarrhea can be voluminous. There can be many different 
episodes of diarrhea. In some cases, diarrhea can occur anywhere from eight to 10 times per day. Now, abdominal pain can also occur. This is often going to occur alongside with the acute diarrhea. So they're gonna occur at the same time. And it's often going to be an abrupt onset of crampy, sharp abdominal pain. We are often going to see it in the right lower quadrant. So if you look at the patient, here's the patient's right side and here's the patient's left side. We break down the abdomen into four quadrants utilizing the belly button as the midpoint. So here is the right lower quadrant and that's where we're going to most often see the pain. It can occur in other parts and including the left lower quadrant, but we can often see in the right lower quadrant and it occurs there because this is where the ilium in part of the jejunum is located. And it can appear to be appendicitis in some cases because of its location. You can also see fever. This can be very common in Campylobacter infections. Up to 90% of patients will have a fever. They're often going to be either mild to quite high. So anywhere from 38.5 degrees Celsius up to 40 degrees Celsius or anywhere from 101.3 Fahrenheit to 104 Fahrenheit. And nausea and vomiting can occur in some cases, although it's going to be more rare. We can also see tenesmus. Tenesmus is a feeling that you need to use the washroom or you need to defecate, but you actually don't. This can occur in up to 25% of patients. Peak symptoms will occur for about 24 to 48 hours. So there'll be a sudden onset of acute diarrhea and abdominal pain. The worst of it will occur in the first 24 to 48 hours, then it will slowly taper off. And the illness generally lasts for approximately five to seven days. So this is going to occur in healthy patients and patients who don't have any complications, but there can be certain cases and certain species of bacteria that can cause worsened complications. We'll discuss those here in a moment. So in the case where a patient is immunocompromised or has a poor immune functioning, they're elderly or they're part of some other patient population, we'll discuss some of those here in a moment, those are going to be most at risk of morbidity, mortality, and prolonged illness. So we can see bacteremia. So bacteremia is where bacteria is present in the blood. So in some cases, Campylobacter can pass through the intestinal mucosa, get into the bloodstream, and cause infection within the blood, that's bacteremia, and there can be some other systemic complications we'll discuss in a moment. These are going to be more common with certain species and in certain patient populations. So some of the species that it is more likely to occur with include Campylobacter fetus, Campylobacter coli, and Campylobacter lari. And it's going to be most common in patients with diabetes, HIV or AIDS, cirrhosis patients, and in cancer patients. We can also see another species of Campylobacter, Campylobacter hyointestinalis, being an important cause of bacteremia in the immunocompromised. And important point to make note of here is that infection with Campylobacter fetus during pregnancy can actually cause fetal loss. So in fact, the rate can be up to 70%. So a very high rate of fetal loss can occur if a pregnant patient is infected with Campylobacter fetus. Some of the complications that can occur include reactive arthritis. So reactive arthritis is going to be something that can occur approximately one to three weeks after a Campylobacter infection. It's likely more common in those with HLA-B27. HLA-B27 is more common in patients who have psoriatic arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis. Now reactive arthritis is going to be an arthritis, an asymmetric arthritis, so it's going to be one-sided generally. So you'll see one joint being affected and not the other, so we can often see it in the knees. We can also see, in some cases, a triad of symptoms, including conjunctivitis or an inflammation of conjunctiva of the eye, urethritis or burning sensation when urinating, and the arthritis, and we can remember by can't see, can't pee, can't bend my knee. We can also see a connection with Guillain-Barre syndrome. So Campylobacter infections are actually an important cause of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Guillain-Barre syndrome is going to be an ascending paralysis. So it's going to start off with paralysis of the lower limbs and it's going to work its way up. And in some cases, if it reaches the diaphragm, it can lead to life-threatening complications. If you want more information on Guillain-Barre syndrome, please check out my lesson on that topic. And then we can also see irritable bowel syndrome in some patients who have had a previous Campylobacter infection. So it's what we would call post-infectious irritable bowel syndromes or PIIBS. This is likely due to multiple factors, including mucosal damage from the bacteria, changes in gut microbiome, hypersensitivity of the intestinal tissues after they've, they've been damaged by Campylobacter. There may be altered gut motility, and there may be continuing low-grade inflammation. So multiple factors are likely playing a role in what we would call post-infectious IBS. Now, some other important complications can include meningitis, 
So meningitis is going to be an inflammation of the meninges. So these are coverings of the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. So patients can have fever, headache, stiff neck. It's going to be more common in neonates, so newborns who get infected with Campylobacter in the elderly and immunocompromised. And it's more specific with regards to a particular species known as Campylobacter fetus. And it's more likely with this particular species because Campylobacter fetus is able to cross the blood-brain barrier. So this is a species that can lead to meningitis, and as I mentioned before, it can lead to fetal loss in patients who are pregnant. So some of the signs and symptoms of meningitis, we mentioned some of them before, but there are certain clinical signs we could do. I won't go over them here in detail, but if you want more information, please check my lesson on the signs and symptoms of meningitis. Now, how do clinicians diagnose and treat campylobacteriosis or campylobacter infection? So it's going to be diagnosed oftentimes by stool culture. If we're going to do a stool culture, though, we need to use special media for the particular bacteria. So we need a media consisting of 42 degrees Celsius environment. Remember that Campylobacter likes hot campfires. And also the media is going to be what we would call microaerophilic. So it has low oxygen levels, usually about 5 to 10% oxygen. A stool PCR can also be performed. This is now a very quick way to diagnose Campylobacter infections, and also another way is by enzyme aminoassay. Now, blood cultures can be performed in those who are suspected of having bacteremia, so at-risk patient groups, if patients have a more severe or more long-lasting clinical presentation, blood cultures can be performed. It can be important to do culture and sensitivities on the bacteria. CSF analysis can be important to assess for meningitis. We will find certain findings on CSF, including low glucose, high protein and high opening pressure, for instance. And then once a clinician has made the diagnosis, how do they treat Campylobacter infections? Before we talk about the treatment, I want to briefly talk about preventative measures because that's going to be very important to simply either not get infected at all or prevent the spread of Campylobacter. So prevention is going to include good hand washing. So anytime you are using the washroom, if you're infected or you're touching raw food items like uncooked chicken, or you're touching an animal that could be infected, always wash your hands afterwards. It's important to separate raw and cooked foods from each other. You want to thoroughly cook foods. You want to avoid raw or unpasteurized milk, and you want to avoid drinking untreated water. So those are some of the ways to prevent infection. But how do clinicians treat this condition if you get infected? Because as I mentioned before, a lot of times the condition can be self-limiting. It can resolve on its own within five to seven days in healthy patients. Oftentimes, there's not much to do except for supportive measures, including oral or IV hydration. IV hydration, if oral is not tolerated, for instance, if they have nausea and vomiting, they may not be able to keep water down. So you might have to do IV hydration. You want to supplement them with electrolytes as well. And then in certain cases, you want to use antibiotics. Now, this can often be in patients who have delayed recovery. If it's a longer lasting illness, perhaps if it's longer than a week, they keep having symptoms, then antibiotics can be useful. Or if they have more severe presentation and these certain findings of a more severe presentation include high fever, bloody diarrhea, especially a lot of it, excessive bowel movements. And if their symptoms are worsening over time, those can be indications for antibiotic use. Or if they are immunocompromised patients, if they're pregnant patients, elderly, or patients with a chronic disease like cirrhosis, all these can be indications for antibiotic use. The antibiotics that are often used are going to be macrolide antibiotics. So antibiotics like azithromycin. Azithromycin is often going to be used 500 milligrams per day for three days. And that can often deal with a gastrointestinal case of Campylobacter infection. Fluoroquinolones like ciprofloxacin used to be used in the past, but they're no longer used due to increasing resistance. And in the case where there is invasive illness or if patients are getting worse and worse, carbapenems like imipenem or miropenem can be used. And oftentimes, for instance, with meningitis, four to six week course of imipenem or miropenem will be utilized. And another important point to make note of here is that it's important to not use anti-motility medications like lopiramide to treat the diarrheal symptoms of Campylobacter. This is the same with regards to Shigella infections, Seminella infections, but especially with regards to Campylobacter infections because it's been noted that the utilization of anti-motility medications, again like lopiramide, can worsen severity of illness, prolong illness, and has also caused fatalities in the past. So do not use anti-motility medications when a patient has Campylobacter infections. If you want to learn more about Shigella infections and Seminella infections, please check my lessons on those topics. 
If you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Also, consider joining as a member for members-only content and early access to videos. Thanks so much for watching, and hope to see you next time.